Hello, physics students. Today, we're going to talk about Newton's third law. I find Newton's third law very fascinating for many reasons. But one of the reasons why is that in, the, in your conscious mind, you, or most people, have very wrong ideas about the phenomenon that Newton's third law applies to. But in the subconscious mind, the deep part of your mind that controls your bodily motions, like how you walk and, and how you throw things, you're a perfect master of Newton's third law. In fact, you mastered Newton's third law in that region of your mind all the way back when you were a little baby. But unfortunately, you take physics tests with your conscious mind. So we have to now convince your conscious mind of A, the ideas that it has about in, objects interaction it, are actually wrong, and then we have to convince it of the right ideas. So today, we're going to spend a lot of time with examples of me just talking, because Newton's third law is not anything to do with calculations, although it does come into play when you're calculating. There, it's a conceptual idea it's, uh, in the way that the first law is. So let's now jump ahead and take a look at what Newton's third law is. Let me pause and give you a chance to jot all of this down. Okay, so here's how you find it in most books. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You, I'm sure, have heard this, but I don't like it because it actually um, doesn't help you apply and understand anything. Uh, so let me give you an example. Now, it's a nice poetic you know, sort of way to say Newton's third law. It flows nicely. But let me give you an example to show you how limited this is in terms of uh, fostering understanding. So let's take um, a, um, a, suppose I take a heavyweight champion of the world boxer, big guy, 250 pounds of pure muscle. And then I have, and then that boxer then, for whatever reason, punches the little girl. Maybe she's like this tall, selling Girl Scout cookies or something, and this is just a bad man. But he winds up and he punches the little girl as hard as he can. Okay? And you might imagine the girl flying across the room and then the boxer standing after. So then you say, okay, I'm going to try and understand the physics of that using Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction and the girl flying across the room. Those are equal and opposite? What does that even mean? So see, it didn't lead to any further understanding. In fact, if I asked you about forces involved, you would probably answer some incorrect things. So this, I prefer the statement of Newton's third law like this. It's not as catchy, it's very clunky, but what it does is it actually defines what action and reaction are. Action is any object A pushing object B with some force, some number of Newtons. The reaction to that is that B now pushes A right back with the same amount of force. If you use this statement, it's foolproof. You get the right answer every single time. Let's take a look at that silly little example I just gave you and see if we can analyze it and see what Newton's third law says about that interaction. So here is boxing glove. And then Okay, so we've got this interaction. The boxer creates a force. Let's call that the action. The reaction, we'll see, is a force back on the boxing glove. So I put FR for reaction. And then I use this template over here to analyze the forces involved. What will be the action is this. A will be the fist.
and I'll make up a number. I don't know what a box of punches. I hear it can be over a thousand pounds of force. So let's say the fist pushes the head with a thousand pounds. What's the reaction to that? Again, what we do is we take fist and we put it over here and we take head and we put it over here. So we now say the head All right, let me pause to give you a chance to write that down. Okay, so fist pushes head with a thousand pounds, that's the action. The reaction is the head pushes the fist right back with a thousand pounds. And that's the remarkable thing, because a lot of people would say when that box of punches, they exert a force and okay, maybe the head hits back a little bit because maybe the boxer gets a, you know, a bruise on the hand or something like that, but it can't be a thousand, okay? Maybe it's like 200 or something like that. And it's not true. The law of nature is that as soon as the boxer puts a force, the other thing hits right back, okay? Surprising. The reason why people tend to think that that can't be true is because of the fact that the head seems to sustain more damage. So it looks like it gets more force than the fist. And the only reason why the head or anything in an interaction like that sustains more damage is because it's built with a weaker structure than the thing, the other object. So the fist is made of Thick bones, of course, were lifting weights with it, boxer practice hitting the punching bag, and the face, you know, it's kind of like really delicate. So when the face gets the thousand pounds, it breaks, the fist gets the thousand pounds, and it doesn't break. So it doesn't matter the situation. You could have a missile hitting a building, which is bigger, neither, the, uh, even though the building crumbles, right? The forces are always the same. Tractor trailer hits a little bicycle parked and the tractor trailer smashes the bicycle to pieces, which is bigger. The forces are the same. It's just that the tricycle or bicycle is made of weaker metal than the thick metal of the truck. So unequal damage makes us believe that the forces are not equal. And also, it doesn't matter that this person is not hitting back, that they're just standing there and receiving the blow, okay? That's another thing. People say, well, how could you be hitting back? You didn't do anything. You stood there. Again, it's a law of nature. In fact, the boxer could punch a dead body, and the dead body is like just sitting there. It's not going to fight back at all. It's just sitting inertly. Punches that, the dead body hits right back with the same amount of force, okay? And of course, um, you know, the damage, you know, uh, which is weaker. What if the boxer turns around and punches a concrete wall? Now we see, okay, instead of the thing getting hit, breaking, it, the wall is more solid. Now the fist is weaker and it breaks, okay? So the force is always the same. In fact, another thing I want to point out is that if the thing getting, getting hit is too weak to return the force, then the thing doing the hitting cannot even produce the force. So take that same boxer, give him a piece of paper. Okay, they could punch a punching bag, make a thousand pounds of force. Now a piece of paper. No matter how strong the boxer is, they will not be able to hit the paper with a thousand pounds because the paper can't give it back, okay? So this explains why, you know, if you punch something in, say, a karate, punches boards and breaks them, okay, it's not going to injure, as, as likely to injure if you hit boards and then they don't break, okay? Because the boards breaking, they don't return as much force because they were weaker, okay? So uh, unequal damage sometimes makes us, people believe that these are not true, this statement. Okay, the other thing that 
fools people into thinking forces are not equal is that sometimes the motions resulting from the forces, the equal forces, are not equal. And um, so to show you that, I have a demonstration that I did yesterday when I was in school because uh, I have the equipment there uh, to show you that uh, sometimes motions are unequal. Uh, but of course, I don't have that here. Uh, so what I'm going to have to do is send you once again back through time with my little time machine to see that demonstration. So again, hold on, brace yourself. Uh, this may make you feel a little com uncomfortable, but I'm going to send you back in time to school yesterday. Before I go any further, I just want to say the standard disclaimer, do not try this at home, okay? Because uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to load this with something that's going to create a little explosion and this tennis ball, which fits tightly in this uh, tube, will be propelled outward. And this will allow us to analyze this in terms of Newton's third law. So, let me give it a shot. Here too. The thing is not really working that well, but all right. So when if this shoots out, remember the point of this is to uh, analyze this in terms of Newton's third law. So let's go. Let's see what happens. Not bad. Okay, not bad at all. Okay. So, hopefully you enjoyed your little time travel trip. Now, what we're going to do is try and explain why the tennis ball shot out with tremendous velocity and then the tennis ball cannon rolled back slowly. In order to understand that example in all of its detail, we need both Newton's third law and the second law. The first thing we need to realize is that the gun and any bullet interact and they interact, according to Newton's th third law, with action being the gun pushing the bullet forward with some number of Newtons. The reaction flipped the sentence around. The bullet pushes the gun back with the same amount of Newtons. So that's the third law. Yes, the forces are the same. Why is the motion different? Well, the uh, Newton's law that tells us how force creates motion is the second law. So... We start off realizing that the force on the gun, and as I said, the force on the bullet are the same. So I draw these Fs the same size. I didn't make one bigger than the other. But if we compare the mass of the gun compared to the mass of the little bullet, the mass of the gun is much larger. So I'm going to represent that just conceptually by a very big M compared to dividing by a little tiny m for the bullet. If I take some number and divide by a big number versus some number divided by a small number, in this case, I get a very small answer because the denominator is big. So the gun accelerates back slightly. But when I do this division, what I get, when I take a number and divide by a very small number, is I get a very large answer. So the acceleration of the bullet is tremendous because the same force applies to a smaller mass. So that explains why the tennis ball shot out fast versus the gun. It also explains why a real gun works that way or even a cannon shooting out a cannonball. Okay, yes, it rolls back, but not as much because of the larger mass. We could take that to an extreme. Let's suppose I take something like this, this tennis ball. I drop it. I can see it accelerate, so it definitely has a force creating an acceleration. So then we ask ourselves, well, what's the other thing 
that it's interacting with. In other words, what is pulling this tennis ball down? Okay? Some people might say gravity is pulling it down. But that's not the correct way to analyze this. What object is pulling this down? Well, I answered that question all the way back when we were talking about forces. And if you don't know the answer, what I'm going to do is use my time machine again. I'll send you back to the day I was talking about forces so you could get an answer to what is pulling this down. So, brace yourself. The first thing I want to point out is that this is pulled down. Now people say, what's pulling this down when I drop it? Oh, gravity's pulling it down. Incorrect. Okay, gravity is kind of what the agent is, but what's really pulling the thing down needs to be an object. Earth pulls this down when I drop it. Earth pulled it down, not gravity. Gravity was the way it pulled it down. Okay, so the answer is Earth. Earth is pulling this down through the force of gravity. So what's the reaction to this being pulled down? Well, we use that format, that structure that I gave you earlier. Earth pulls tennis ball down with maybe half a newton. The reaction is the tennis ball pulls the earth up with 0.5 newtons. Is that really true that this tennis ball is pulling the whole world up and accelerating it? Because that's what happens. If it pulls it, it accelerates. Well, it's basically an extreme example of this. So, let's see, the ball, as I said, let's suppose it's pulled down with 0 0.49 newtons. And it has a mass of 0 0.05 kilograms. Divide that out and it has a very noticeable acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. So the ball goes down. What about the Earth? So it experiences the same 0.49 Newton force. So let me write the equation first. But what's the mass of the Earth? Well, it turns out, if you want to know, you can find out on the front cover of our reference table. Right about here, you see the mass of the Earth, and it is approximately 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. A huge number. Just to show you visually, that's five. 198 with 22 zeros following. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 zeros. A huge mass. When you divide that out, you get about 8 times 10 to the negative 26 meters per second squared. A tiny acceleration. That is point with 25 zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, and 25 zeros and then an eight. That's not even a millionth of a meter per second squared. That's not even a billionth, not even a trillionth. And if we use D equals one half AT squared for the, let's say that takes 0.5 seconds to fall. The tennis ball falls for 0.5 seconds. If we plug that into d equals one half a t squared, we get approximately a distance of 1 times 10 to the minus 26th meters. So yes, the earth does fall up. The entire earth comes up, but it comes up such a tiny distance. To give you a reference point, an atom is about 10 to the minus 10th meters. So we're talking not even the billionth or trillionth of a single atom. The whole earth rises as the tennis ball falls.
so fascinating. It happens, we just can't feel it or even detect it. Okay, so Newton's third law. Okay, now, hopefully I've convinced you that even though damage might not be equal or motion might not be equal, the forces are indeed the same whenever any two things interact. Hopefully I've convinced you, but remember at the beginning of this video, I said that in your subconscious mind, the part that controls your bodily movements, you're a master of Newton's third law. What was I talking about there? Let's take a look at example, I guess, oh, you know what? I never created a pause to allow you to copy any of this down, so let me do that now. If you haven't, go ahead and catch up to these notes. Okay, so example three. Let's take a runner. Track me. The gun goes off. And the runner starts running. How do they do that? Well, if you think about it, well, normally you don't think about it, right? You just start running. But if you actually think about it, which way do your legs push when you try and go forward? Some of you say, that's easy, they push forward, right? They don't. Think about it, you lean this way, and then you kick back on the earth, you push that way, right? Imagine squirting some oil, and you try and run. Which way is your foot gonna go? It's not gonna go forward, it's gonna slide backwards. So the runner, tries to push the earth or the ground backwards. Let's call that F action. The reaction goes forward on the runner. So let's use that template I put on the board in the beginning here. So the action will be runner pushes Round, back, I don't know, with let's say 200 Newtons. What's the reaction to that? Ground. pushes runner okay So, uh, let me pause to give you a chance to copy this down. Okay, so, runner pushes ground back with 200 so that the ground pushes the runner forward with 200. You don't even think about it. You put your leg behind you and you push back and you go forward. You don't put your leg in front and push the ground forward because that'll make you go backwards. So, your deep subconscious mind, without even thinking of it, knows Newton's third law and how to manipulate to create the forces it needs to. Same thing when you're swimming. Say you're floating in a pool and you want to swim to the ladder over there. What do you do? Without even thinking, you lift your hand above the water, then you put it in the water here, and you push the water back. Swimmer pushes water back, water pushes swimmer forward. Okay, you do it again, you push the water back, water pushes you forward, okay? So, third law. In fact, if anything wants to go forward, it has to push a second object in the backward direction. If there's no second object, the object cannot go forward. 
If you take that runner in outer space and they're floating there and they try and run forward, their legs are just going to wiggle like this. And you might be saying, well, what about a rocket ship? That's just one object. It's in a vacuum out in outer space, right? There's no air to push against, nothing. It's just floating there. How does it go forward? Well, the rocket ship actually is more than one object. The fuel erupts and it shoots the flame out the back. Let's call that the exhaust. Rocket pushes exhaust back. Exhaust pushes rocket forward. And that's how it goes. Yes, there's still two objects, the exhaust being one of the objects. It's no different than putting that tennis ball can in an outer space. Light off, boom, and then the ball shoots back. That's like the exhaust, and then the car rolled forward. That'd be like the rocket going forward. You always need a second object to move forward, okay? All right, so um, the last thing I want to talk about is... Um, Oh, and one thing I also wanted to mention, I forgot to mention this. So this interaction, it comes from the sneakers, the traction of the runner. And I've mentioned this before, that it's the force of friction. And that force of friction doesn't always slow an object down. Just as often, it speeds objects up. Take away this friction, put this runner on grease, their feet are just going to sit there and spin out, not going to go anywhere. Friction can speed up objects, cause them to go faster. All right, so one last example. Uh, another misconception. You may have heard this, okay? Two cars, 60 miles an hour, collide. Oh, that's terrible. That's like hitting a brick wall going 120 miles an hour. 60 this way, 60 that way. It's like 120 collision. That's really bad. Okay, I'd rather hit a brick wall. Not true. Okay, so let's take a look at a car accident hitting something immovable. We don't need to get fancy with drawing the car. We could draw like a little Volkswagen bug or something like that. Okay, here's our car. Hits the wall. Big, thick cement wall. Unbreakable. So, the car obviously puts a force on the wall. In fact, if there was like, you know, a dentable material here, some metal, it would bend in, right? So that there's definitely a car putting a force. We could call that a reaction, reaction, it doesn't matter, which is... So, third law says car pushes wall with million newtons, I don't know, make something up. The wall pushes right back with that same number of newtons. The reaction. Okay. So the force diagram of the car would look something like this. This is the gravity, the earth pulling down, the normal force, the roadway holding the car up, and then the wall gives this tremendous force here on car from the wall. Again, the first law comes into play here because a lot of people will say, well, there's the forward force also of this car, and it's not there, so don't draw it. And they say that's the inertia of the car squeezing it into the wall, that forward force of impact. No, it is not. The third law says that the forward force goes on the wall, not the car, and the reaction is the wall pushes right back on the car. So the forward force, yes, there is a forward force in impact, but it goes on the other object, not the one doing the hitting. There's no inertia force keeping that car forward, squeezing it into the wall. Okay, there's only backwards to decelerate it and stop it. So that's the force diagram. Again, no forward force. But what about this business of if we had another car here instead, it'd be worse. Not true. Here's why. This car is putting the force on the wall of a 60 mile an hour car slamming into something. So that's the applied force of this car, 60 miles an hour of car effect, oomph, into the wall. The reaction is the wall pushes back with 
an oomph of 60 miles an hour car crash in the opposite direction. So it creates the impact because of Newton's third law, identical if you hit two cars 60 miles an hour or a brick wall 60 miles an hour, the same collision, okay? So a surprising law, okay? Lots of concepts there. Forces of any two things crashing together, doesn't matter what's doing the hitting, what's receiving the hitting, the forces of one object, the same as the force back on the other object. If the damage is unequal, it's because one object's thicker and can withstand that force, but the force is still the same. If the motion is different, it's because one object has more mass, so for the same force, there's less acceleration. And also, you know, things with car crashes, uh, often people get wrong also. That's Newton's third law. I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you in the next physics video.